Jonathan, thank you very much. And first of all, uh, everybody on this call, I'm very privileged and happy to be with you here again today for this uh, uh, fourth in a series of, of uh, webinars that we're doing on the global digital and tech economy. Uh, today's talk is called the Trillion Dollar Data Frontier, Power to the People, um, a bit provocative on purpose because what I'm going to show you is a tremendous challenge that uh, all of you will have to be part of mastering over the next uh, uh, five to 10 years as this is coming at us. But before I dive in and share my slide deck and give you the talk, um, let me just introduce myself. There may be uh, a number of you on this call that already know me. Uh, so you've heard this before, uh, and I apologize, but to those of you who are new, I very much look forward to seeing you on one of the HALT campuses around the world. I am what they used to call a global professor at HALT, uh, which, is, uh, which really just signifies that I am obligated and happily so to teach around the world. I'm based on uh, my home campus in San Francisco, uh, where I live, but I uh, travel or used to travel around the world to every campus and greatly enjoy that part of the whole world. Um, let's see, I have been a professor for about eight years. I teach uh, strategy, innovation, economics courses, and then also futures and foresight courses uh, that sort of span across. Um, and, um, uh, and I came to HALT um, uh, with about 20 plus years of experience as an executive in global technology companies such as Qualcomm, Boeing, Vodafone, uh, a technology startup um, uh, before launching my own uh, and uh, consulting. So, uh, you know, in, in your, um, you know, employer categories, I sort of hit on corporate startup and, and consulting. And one of the hallmarks of my teaching is that I'm very interactive. Uh, I very much enjoy a mentoring, coaching oriented teaching style. And so what you'll uh, most likely experience if you have me as your professor is that uh, I, I want to advise you on your career, not just on the substance of my courses, but on your trajectory, because there's nothing more, uh, uh, there's nothing more satisfying for me to see you successful out there and to have had a small part in, in that success. Um, so, uh, so like some of you also, depending on where you are and where you're trying to enter the whole world, I am an immigrant, I originally, uh, hailed from uh, Europe uh, and am now in the United States. When I immigrated, things were a bit easier, uh, but, uh, but quite frankly, uh, where there is a will, there is a way. Uh, I can only tell you, uh, be persistent, pursue your dream, and to the degree where I can be part of that dream, where Holt can be part of that dream, we very much want to. Okay, so with that said, uh, let me share my screen, and I'm going to ask Stephen to please just confirm <clears throat> that uh, he is seeing this, that you all can see this. Uh, yes. Um, so Wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to go into presenter mm -hmm. mode. Yeah, there you go. All good, Stephen? Yeah, super. Excellent. Okay, so uh, the trillion dollar, uh, dollar data frontier, power to the people. Uh, look, I'm a businessman. I look for new frontiers. I love exploration. I love discovery. That's really my life. And, uh, and so to me, uh, this, uh, this uh, avalanche of data that we are experiencing right now uh, is uh, first and foremost, a tremendous opportunity. It's a tremendous opportunity to become smarter, to become more intelligent uh, about the world around us. And there's a lot of value to be created for people and for businesses. And of course, as we do that, we have to do it <clears throat> um, uh, uh, consciously and conscientiously, meaning with a high degree of responsibility and accountability because as you'll see, a lot is at stake here, okay? Um, there's nothing less at stake than the future of society. <clears throat> if you have attended some of my other webinars, you may have seen this and a few other slides I'm gonna show you just as a launch pad in order to get to the real meat of this, which is really how do we uh, not just generate, but curate and trade uh, data so that it can become the next growth frontier for humans, for societies, but also for businesses. Uh, but as we do so, <clears throat> excuse me, it is very important that we realize that as we take on data, which uh, identifies uh, uh, individuals, uh, uh, groups of people, families, uh, societal patterns, we have to be sensitive to the fact that we are really analyzing and, uh, um, and manipulating, uh, and I don't mean this necessarily in a bad way, 
we are handling and uh, treating, curating um, uh, the very fabric of our economies, of our societies, right? So with special insight comes special uh, responsibility. This is not just about Industry 4.0 <coughs> or the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which you know, has a very uh, economic, industrial, technological connotation. This really is about changing people's lives, hopefully for the better. Why is that happening? Well, we have started collecting inordinate amounts of data. Uh, this has been a startling data point for me for a long time. Um, you know, we are now making uh, very simple uh, sensors that have very sim simple semiconductors in them uh, uh, more cheaply than one grain of rice. Now, imagine, let that sink in and imagine what that means. I can now create these trillion sensor programs like uh, Hewlett Packard and, and others are doing, not just here in the United States, but in China uh, and elsewhere as well. And I can sprinkle those sensors through uh, our economy, through our society. Heck, I can even sprinkle them through nature to understand environmental impacts better, to understand tectonic shifts, to understand soil conditions and weather patterns, and really mesh all of that with our economic and societal uh, activity. And, and so right there, you can see the tremendous power that uh, these cheap sensors and the data that we're collecting with them uh, can bring to us. In fact, we are uh, going to be generating to the tune of 173 zettabytes of data by 2025. That's a, in my humble estimate, a conservative uh, um, a data point here. Today, we're at about 34, 35 zettabytes of data. Um, we are seeing a spike that is also being accelerated by uh, the uh, uh, corona crisis, by COVID-19, of course, because we are all forced to be much more digital as our physical movement is much more limited. And so, uh, so frankly, this, this data point is conservative. What is more uh, uh, interesting, of course, as you may have heard me say at some point or other, is that only 0.5% of that data today is analyzed meaning we, we, uh, we are just now starting to make sense of all of this data. And of course, that's where we use AI and machine learning in order for us to then extract the real insights from that data, which is really uh, where the value lies, right? <coughs> now, uh, I wanna put a little bit more meat around just how much data that is. If you are imagining one connected electrified automobile let's say in, uh, in 10 years from now, 2030, okay, that will be generating about 4,000 gigabytes of data every day that it is in its existence, okay? So uh, it will be generating that data both on its driving behavior, but also on its context, meaning on the road conditions, the infrastructure around it, on other cars and traffic, on the weather, uh, weather, weather conditions on the road, and of course, on you inside the car, because as more and more uh, automobiles get automated in their operation, um, you get to do more different kinds of things in these cars, and the makers of these cars, and the people who provide the applications that go into these cars, they are of course intimately interested in what you are doing in that car, because they wanna bring you ever greater value that you eventually uh, pay for. Now, this is an image that shows you how important this shift is in a traditional industry like automotive. Uh, just look at uh, you know, the, uh, the, the light and dark brown segments here, the light blue as well. Um, uh, it, you know, this is essentially where the value of technology and electronic technology in the automobile is, uh, is migrating. Okay, and again, computing platforms. Why computing platforms? Because we need to process all that data, right? So increasingly, we are going from a very hardware-driven world and simple software, simple electronics into much, much more of a data processing world, even inside, uh, inside the car, or what we used to call the car. This is penetrating every uh, sector of society. And, and really, this is, a, uh, this is a slide that you all need to really memorize. Uh, and uh, you know, I will be tracking this 
through my research, uh, eager to see what the 2020 data is here, much less the 2027 data. But take a look at the 2007 lineup, right? These were the top um, 10 companies uh, by a revenue uh, in, 20, uh, in 2007, so 2007. And you, what you'll see here, of course, is what? You'll see, you know, you'll see the big oil companies, you'll see big banks, okay? Uh, and yes, you'll see a car maker and you see an engineering company, right? And so, uh, so really, uh, it, you know, that goes to uh, really signifying um, the structure of our economy in 2007 still as it was beginning to change, right? If you were to do uh, 1997, you'll see an even starker picture because we were very much based on hard engineering, hardware engineering, infrastructure engineering, oil, energy, right, uh, uh, type, um, uh, type, type sectors. Now, look by contrast at 2017, and you'll see, you know, if you look a little bit, the obvious, right? Uh, all, really, almost all but one player here uh, is new, um, and they're all technology companies. Uh, Microsoft has stayed the same, and my hunch is that uh, it, it will uh, still be the same in, uh, in 2000 uh, or for 2000. Um, but really, the underlying question here is what makes all these companies so valuable and what makes their revenue so juicy is not just that they're tech, okay, anybody can do tech, but that they have a lot of data, that they generate a lot of data and a lot of revenue from that data. So really, uh, data is indeed the new oil. That is only going to become uh, more so as humans are becoming more and more part of the products that we are <clears throat> creating, right? So just focus on that, on that blue box here on top, okay? Don't bother with anything else. This is a slide taken from a uh, fourth industrial revolution presentation. And this blue box has a, ha has a product in it, a widget. You know, let's call it a car on a production run, okay? Or let's say like a lamp uh, that you have right in front of you or, uh, or around you and that lamp is being manufactured somewhere. Now, the manufacturer puts a semantic space around that product, right? A virtual space uh, inside the production run, inside the machinery, inside the backend servers that are running the factory. And that semantic space, lines of code describing what exactly is inside the semantic space. So what are the specifications of the lamp, okay? How bright is it supposed to burn uh, or shine? Um, uh, you know, when does it need to be upgraded or replaced? Uh, what are the different parts? Who are the suppliers? What's the cost structure? Uh, who made it? Who do you call if you have a problem? Okay. All of that, of course, is tremendously important for the manufacturer, right? That's the fourth industrial revolution part of it. But here is another very important part of, uh, of this for society in terms of data society, right? This lamp now will, as it is over your head or right in front of you or behind you, will start to understand you as a person. Who are you talking to? Uh, uh, how are you talking to them? Uh, you know, how do you relate to them by way of inference? Uh, how often are you in the room? Where do you go when you leave the room because there's another such lamp that is sensor enabled outside? Okay, and of course, things like body temperature, uh, facial recognition in terms of, uh, you know, what is your, what, what, are, what is your, uh, what are your facial expressions? Um, you know, are you healthy? Are you tired? All those types of things. You are now becoming part of the product of the lamp. And just like the automobile, the hardware of the lamp will, of course, be important. It'll continue to be important as a foundation, but in terms of value creation and value capture, meaning the money you make from the lamp, okay, uh, you as a data construct that the, lamp that the lamp creates is much more important than the lamp itself, okay? So we are part of the increasingly digital nervous system of society that is all about data, 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 which is why we call it dataism, right? Dataism is the new belief that data is really what it's all about at the end of the day. Now, uh, this uh, goes even further. This goes to analyzing your productivity at work. This goes to analyzing how well you conduct yourself in interviews, 
how well you uh, speak the truth and authentically portray your best efforts uh, on, let's say, a sales reporting call every quarter, because we can now analyze how authentic you are and what your agendas might be, okay? So uh, right there, you can see that that's tremendously valuable, of course, for economic actors like corporations and the people that want to figure you out in order to either hire you or sell you more stuff or whatever it may be. And of course, we also have to be very careful here because you want to retain some sense of agency, some sense of choice, and of course, privacy, okay? Um, that will become ever more stark when we get into people's brains as we are starting to, to do, really frankly have started to do for a while. But this year, of course, Elon Musk, as he announced, is getting into the brain with human trials as part of his uh, uh, Neuralink uh, uh, venture, right? We all know him uh, from, from Tesla, of course, but he's got this other venture that is uh, tremendously potent for the future of, of how we extract data from the human brain, how we put data into the human brain, how we enhance memory function. And right there, you can see, as we get to know ourselves better, we become more honest about ourselves, we uh, we let other people know more about ourselves. That can be tremendously valuable, but at the same time, tremendously scary. And we have to be watchful here that we don't extract the wrong things or put the wrong things into the head, right? As we do that, we are having 100 billion neurons in our brains. Incidentally, that's the same number of stars in the universe. Interesting uh, coincidence. Um, we're having 100 billion neurons in our heads collide with 340 trillion, trillion, trillion IP addresses we are creating, remember, with these smart sensors out in the real world, okay? Because everything around you will have an IP address and will start to sense you, right? Your keyboard will, your clothing will, your eyewear, your uh, contact lenses, uh, like I told you, the lamps around you, right? Any item of furniture will. And of course, um, um, your brain itself will mesh with all of those sensors and will start to communicate. Now, that may hopefully happen through very controlled channels, but imagine what were to happen if we didn't control it. What a tremendous uh, wave of noise, right, coming out of your brain and being put back into your brain. And at the same time, also immensely valuable, the kinds of insights that we can get uh, about uh, our society and about our economy, and about how we work as human beings, what we need and what we don't need. So let me pause here and ask uh, Stephen to uh, launch uh, this poll. Uh, I would like to know, is this a good thing or a bad thing that we're moving toward a surveillance economy in which your data, everybody's data, um, uh, becomes part of our uh, data-ism uh, nervous system? I'd love to hear. Uh, I'd love to hear your answer on this. Okay. Are we ticking along, Stephen? Yes, I can see a lot of people doing it. Half of them Excellent. are okay. through Very it right glad. now. Mm -hmm. And I can see it's a race. <laughs> <laughs> just a smaller hint. So just a few more people. Um, make your choice. Yeah, looking good. So I would say, I'll give you five seconds. Five, four, <coughs> three, two, and last choice. And here we go. So share the results now. Here you go. Okay. Yes. No. Undecided. We are seeing a uh, uh, we, we are seeing a slight um, uh, majority for yes, I can tell that, uh, you know, many people uh, are probably optimistic, uh, cautiously optimistic, as we say, right? Um, really, what we should have done is we should have had another uh, way to answer this that says both, right? Not just undecided, but both. And then I bet you a lot of you would have uh, chosen both, right? And if, if you think I'm wrong, or if you think I'm right, please say so in the chat thread, which I have open, so I can monitor your responses as I'm talking. Um, you know, that's absolutely right, Emiliano, right? We have to have uh, restrictions, right? We, yes, we want new horizons, but we also have to have what we call guardrails, okay? 
And look, many business people of previous generations used to say, the less regulation, the better. I would tell you that's not right. We need to have the right regulation that enables experimentation with this so we can extract the right value, uh, but ensure that we are kept safe, okay? So it's not about less or more regulation, it's about right regulation, okay? So yes, exactly, Kenneth, it depends on which side you are in the data economy. If you are a owner of or an executive in a global platform, like some of you will become, okay? Then of course you may like this, and of course, we at HALT here are here to help you think through um, how you can become a societal, uh, a responsible societal executive here, uh, an executive who will safeguard us while harvesting all this data, okay? And that's really what this is about. And I will show you where I think this should be going, okay? So now, uh, if we close the poll, yes, thank you very much. Let me walk on here. Um, and tell you that, you know, we have made exactly the points that I see here in the chat thread and by way of this poll uh, in this piece in Wired Magazine. Uh, I've authored this piece with my uh, co-author, Mark Nitzberg. As you uh, may know, he and I wrote a, a book about artificial intelligence. It's called Solomon's Code, Humanity in the World of Thinking Machines. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. Uh, just Google my name and, and, and the title Solomon's Code and you'll find it. And uh, we also uh, um, uh, felt that this is something that we actually uh, need to be very proactive about as tech executives, you know, giving people back some power over how this data is harvested and then traded and priced out, right? Because you want to be in control. You want to get remunerated for your data at some point beyond just having access to information. And you want that to be fair. Uh, most people do not want to forego uh, you know, data harvesting because it makes for better services, but we want to be treated fairly and we want to have agency. And we're seeing a lot of people now talking about that. Um, and, and this is coming and that's the new paradigm that you as digital executives in uh, this brave new world will have to heed. Uh, you know, not, notwithstanding, of course, that mandate, we have seen uh, a lot of infractions over the past um, uh, a couple of years, really. But just look at the, the, the time axis here, 2017, 2018, okay, uh, there have been more of this sort in the past year and a half. But look at just this snapshot of this one uh, year, okay, um, you know, where, where are we with this? Where are we with resolving the, this conflict? We are seeing a lot of infractions, uh, uh, both in terms of data harvesting, but also in terms of how data is being processed, right? Autopilot crashes, et cetera. Um, data being sold, um, uh, the wrong data being harvested, uh, facial recognition data, discriminatory data, bias data, right? So very clearly, we have to get a lot better at curating the data, at governing the data before we do anything with that data, okay? So I will tell you uh, a very concrete example why this matters uh, to you. This is really the new uh, wave of uh, security, of, uh, of confidentiality, of privacy, okay? It used to be uh, that we were on the left-hand side here with traditional hacks, behind the firewall, right? Hackers going into the United States uh, Office of Personnel Management, then comparing that with data extracted from a hack on United Airlines in order to figure out uh, who is a spy and where are they going, okay? Uh, just, to give you, just to give you one example, okay? Then we went to the middle here where uh, we had data leaks <coughs> that were semi-legal, okay? Like the, 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 the data acquisition uh, uh, from Facebook, uh, Facebook data by Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica that then combined the Facebook data with DMV, Department of Motor Vehicle data, which is where you go to register yourself uh, for not just uh, uh, driver's permits, but also for voting and things like that. Uh, meshing together these data streams and making sense of, uh, of what you are all about. All of that still exists and it's still big. And now we're drifting onto the right side here, which is called omni fingerprinting or footprinting, okay? What that means is that uh, data analytics companies uh, can now gauge from 
the size of screen you use, the fonts you use, your browsing history, your operating system, um, your screen resolution, but also, of course, uh, how you move through various websites during the day. They can now ascertain who you are. They can draw inferences on your identity and your preferences and your profile, okay? Now, uh, that is happening every day as you travel the web. This was featured prominently in the New York Times where um, uh, one of the reporters there, one of the journalists, the writers, um, uh, paired up with a uh, cyber forensics team and found out that with every website uh, he was going to throughout the day, he was encountering uh, dozens and dozens of trackers, 47 I think was the number, and these trackers would track his browsing behavior, his content uh, interests uh, on every website. And some of these red lines are uh, trackers that would operate on different websites and then triangulate you like this, but you also like that, and you like this over here, and this is who you are. And that's why I can now sell that profile to people who want to influence you when you vote or who want to influence you when you make commercial decisions, okay? Look, I'm the last one to say that some of these websites shouldn't have some impression of who you are and what you want, because again, we want those services, but shouldn't you have a say in how that happens? Shouldn't you be allowed to transparently see what's happening with your data, who's tracking you and what the intent is? We believe so, and of course, it's big, big, big money at stake here. $200 billion of data brokers, uh, money that revenue that data brokers are making. I'm just mentioning a few of these companies here on the left side. That doesn't even include the 200 plus billion dollars that uh, Google, Facebook, and others are making with your data, uh, selling that data to, to advertisers, right? So we're talking a $400 billion plus uh, play here. And so, of course, the people that are behind the data trading are saying, well, wait a minute, that's our bread and butter, okay? And so we need to find a way to, uh, uh, to, to both make money with that data, but also safeguard our privacy and our what's called digital dignity, right? Um, uh, to use a term from Jaron Lanier. Um, so I'll give you an example of why this is uh, potentially problematic for uh, some of your employers. Uh, you know, let's say here is Anne, a patent analyst uh, at a company. Uh, she uses Google patents because the U.S. Patent Trademark Office only has limited uh, types of data publicly available. And so she goes on Google patents. Google, of course, knows what she's looking for. Meanwhile, her colleague Jim, the software engineer, is going to stackoverflow.com. Those of you who are software engineers probably know what that is. And there he uh, looks for snippets of code and advice on coding, but also for a job advertisement. So somebody is tracking what Jim is doing, not just in terms of his professional coding interests, but also how stable he is at the company and what his interests are in terms of career movement. Then there is Peter, the marketing director, who is preparing a press release for the next day uh, by his CEO and he is going on all kinds of tech websites, you know, Wall Street Journal tech section and TechCrunch and, and you know, these sites. Uh, and somebody is tracking what he might be writing about the next morning. Now you put all three together and right there, uh, a picture evolves of what the company that all three are employed by might be up to next. That is an issue. Uh, and this is why employees and consumers alike are very concerned and increasingly uh, distrusting. 76% of all users in the U.S. increasingly uh, concerned, um, and 79% and, um, and want some kind of compensation for data sharing. Okay, now how can that happen? Well, um, the uh, uh, internet and data companies will tell you, well, that's why we have privacy charters, okay? And as you saw from this previous slide, 90% of users consent to that, those privacy charters very readily. If you were to just study, though, the privacy charters or the privacy uh, uh, guidelines, uh, uh, user agreements, I should say, uh, of all of the apps that are on your phone, you would find that you'd have to read 900 pages and spend 34 hours of your time to read them, and nobody does that. Of course, these are often designed on purpose uh, so as to not be very legible by the average consumer. All of us just click right through. But my friends, I would uh, submit to you that that's not right. Uh, we need to uh, have some kind of rapport here that's more productive and more respecting 
uh, of our um, of our data dignity. Now, um, uh, the other problem that we're seeing is that there is disagreement between uh, the data companies and the consumers and employees, as it were, because all of us who are consumers are also at some point or other uh, an employee somewhere, right? Uh, the, the data companies are saying, look, it's maybe, uh, you know, 0.5 uh, cents, uh, maybe it's 26 cents, maybe it's $1.72, depending on what the data point is that we want from you, okay, how important it is to us and our customers, uh, meaning the customers that get your data, uh, whereas some people are, uh, some consumers are saying, I want, you know, $36 uh, uh, per month or per year. Uh, and then some estimates uh, by Jaron Lanier and Glenn Weil, for instance, at, at Microsoft uh, have said that really the data to a family, an average family, um, a working family could be as much as $20,000 a year. Um, you can see there is a wide rift in understanding how much your data is worth. Uh, you are probably rather sensitive about some of your data, whereas the data companies are saying that most of it is completely harmless, okay? The two sides aren't talking and they aren't meeting yet. The market is not clearing, okay? The damage, however, meanwhile, is being done with corporate intelligence leaks, with, uh, you know, employee safety and a culture of digital wellness not happening. Uh, we are losing trust and intimacy with our customers. And of course, there are compliance risks with the European Union GDPR, the General Data Protection Directive, and now also the California Consumer Protection Act, uh, CCPA, which is modeled uh, roughly along the same lines. So for us as future executives, as entrepreneurs, as business advisors, as analysts, we need to look at the situation and say, it's not enough to say, you know, I care that the market clears because I feel bad for people and I do understand the conundrum of data companies. Uh, we need to bring both together. You need to look at this in a clear eyed way and say there's actual uh, uh, issues here for uh, for companies that are not necessarily digitally native. OK, and you we need to as as solution providers help companies work through that. OK. As we do that, of course, we care about the market, how many people are out there, right, that are interested in this. There are some 856 million people of inter, uh, that are using the internet across North America and Europe. 630-ish uh, million of them uh, or so are increasingly concerned and 522 million are already doing something, whether it's uh, going to privacy mode on your browser or you know, DuckDuckGo or, uh, you know, buying yourself a VPN subscription. Um, and, and so a lot of people are signaling that they have that sensitivity already. And of course, um, you know, we need to get to the tip of the iceberg here, which is really a more proactive uh, way of a more customized limiting of certain types of cookies, certain kinds of trackers, certain kinds of privacy settings, uh, that allow you to selectively engage with digital companies, leave your data where you think that's okay, and block it where you think that's not okay. So um, I would love to hear from you here on what kinds of mechanisms do you think we could enable uh, to do that? Uh, you saw the numbers, the numbers are big, uh, people are concerned. Uh, we as business people also know we need to keep making money. So just throw out some 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 comments here. I see Frederick. Thank you. Blockchain, right? Blockchain. Very interesting comment. Yes, um, we can uh, leave data in blockchains and then uh, make sure that it is only touched by those who we uh, decidedly empower to get it out. Okay, at the right commercial terms. The of course the problem with blockchain is that it is still very much. Uh, capacity limited, but blockchain is definitely part of the picture. Thank you very much. See, Carlos, the problem with VPN is that, and I use it as well, um, that VPN really uh, <clears throat> uh, is a blanket solution, okay? And if you just want uh, sort of sledgehammer style protection, you're absolutely right, of course, but it doesn't allow you to say, I want these types of news sites or commercial sites when I go there to have my data because they're very transparent, they give me a good deal, and I don't want these types of companies uh, to have my data. So we need a bit more customized, individualized approach, and right now, that's not really uh, uh, being made possible. 
Same with Sarab, right? Uh, encryption, very good comment, Sarab. Thank you. I love it when you guys think along and you're dedicated and active. And of course, encryption also means that none of your data is really accessible to anybody. But that's not what you want, Sarab, right? Because then at some point, the company that is looking at you will say, well, I can no longer give you free services if you don't want to give me your data. And you're again at this stalemate, okay? So that is, of course, why we need to get to a different approach. And here's the approach that I am, uh, that, that I am suggesting, okay? Um, we, uh, uh, we want our personal privacy charter, right? Because Frederick here might say, I just want to be completely anonymous, okay? Whereas, you know, maybe Carlos is, or, or maybe Frederick or whoever is saying, I, you know, I'm okay with selective uh, uh, harvesting of my data, uh, but I want to have a say in where that data goes. And then maybe some other people, uh, I don't know, uh, Maximiliano here, right, might say, yes, and beyond that, I actually am okay with the data going to different places, but I want to be paid for that, okay? See, the thing is, my friends, privacy is a word we all use, but we all mean different things. There are some people who say, ah, I don't care. There are other people who say, I want to be completely dark. And there is a vast uh, gray zone, uh, gray area in between. So in my humble opinion, uh, and in my team's opinion, um, we believe that there is no one size fits all uh, uh, a solution uh, to privacy because privacy is not a one size fits all problem, okay? So we need to have our own privacy charters and in fact, uh, I have a team, uh, we're researching this right now, we'll be publishing on that um, uh, in, in a while, and uh, in how we design, um, uh, how we design uh, privacy charters. And then we want to design autonomous agents that go out there and say, um, I am tracking the trackers, I will let you know who is tracking you, I will raise a red flag when I think somebody is not complying with your privacy charter, and I will then Give you a uh, give you a, a watermark for your data that says this data is Frederick's or Sarab's or uh, Akilesh's uh, data. Uh, I see you guys are responding on the thread here. Okay, and if you want Akilesh's data, then uh, you're going to have to engage him, and you you might have to pay for that data. Okay, and in that way, I give Akilesh a solution that he wants. Uh, and I also give Sarab and Frederick their solutions that they want because these solutions are all different, right? So that's the approach that I think we need to take by giving these uh, watermarks uh, in your data footprint. You uh, essentially create a virtual wall around your data and the data is discoverable should you ever sue anybody, right? Now, again, we do not want uh, to halt digital traffic but we do want fair and transparent trading terms. And you've seen the numbers, the time for that has come. In fact, we believe that there needs to be uh, uh, a, a data market that is privacy assured, right? So how does that work? Well, um, we sign these uh, personal privacy charters. Uh, we ideally get the backing from our employers because we, we are, corporate employees as well, okay? And we will then uh, claim that data ownership as we go into a transaction infrastructure. Um, and whether that is a, uh, a smart agent or it's uh, what uh, Lanier and Weil have called the, the MIDS uh, concept in their paper, uh, some kind of trading uh, marketplace for data that assures, privacy assures uh, your particular data. And that says to companies out there, I am the agent of, um, uh, you know, of uh, Maximiliano, or uh, let me pick on uh, some other names here, right? Uh, uh, Mary or uh, G10, right? I'm hoping that I'm not butchering these names. And I will make sure that uh, within the fair play of this data market infrastructure with a regulator, just like the SEC uh, uh, is, uh, or the Federal Trade Commission in the United States are overseeing trading, fair trading, uh, fair business practices. We need somebody to oversee fair data trading, privacy assured uh, data trading. And then we will open up auctions for uh, those data sets so that 
you can give your data uh, to the person that respects and values it the most, okay? Now, why would this work? Because privacy is quickly becoming a privacy, uh, a, a enterprise differentiator, okay? Um, uh, it, companies like Sonic, like Deutsche Telekom, like Salesforce, uh, they're hiring uh, uh, humane use and, uh, and also ethics uh, officers, right? I saw earlier uh, da uh, data privacy uh, officer at GE. Um, uh, Frederick, is that so? That's a, that's, we have to talk because uh, this is, of course, if that's the case, um, uh, this is something that we need to interview you for uh, and, uh, and pick your brain because that's exactly at the cutting edge of where this digital economy is going. Frederick, uh, please do ping me uh, later on email or LinkedIn so we can engage with each other because increasingly we are seeing companies like GE, like IBM, like Microsoft taking a stance and saying, you know what, since when has it become acceptable, private, acceptable business practice that we throw our customers under the bus, that we manipulate them, okay? That is clearly not the intent, of course, and we also then need to acknowledge that and fix our business practices. And there are some shining examples out there that are doing this already. So um, how do we ensure all of this? Well, uh, this is a point I made before. Um, COVID will drive data, uh, uh, massive data uh, floods, hopefully data trading. And as we are pushed to let these apps track us, you know, through contact tracing systems, for instance, we also push for more privacy, right? Uh, countries like Singapore, like Germany, are now putting these private, these uh, trackers, these uh, contact tracing systems out there uh, that are um, that are giving us the opportunity to get uh, protected and also have our privacy safeguarded. Okay, see, it's not zero sum. You can make money with that, uh, and uh, and you can be respectful to people at the same time. Now. Um, for us as business executives, and I'm not going to deep dive into this, but if you come to Hope, we will uh, train you on how to do this, uh, how to design ethical and human-centric business cases. Um, we need to make sure that we have data checks in our companies, that we uh, log where the data came from, who collected it, uh, what they did in order to make it bias-free, uh, to guarantee privacy. We need to have algorithm and model audits uh, through confidentiality bound expert boards. Uh, we need to do societal impact testing and I can show you how to do this. It's being done in other areas like, um, uh, like uh, the, the regulatory uh, frameworks for medications, for instance. And we need to have governance oversight uh, in our companies from the board down to the most junior coder. What must not happen is that the junior coder gets thrown under the bus when they do something wrong, but the board member walks away. So we need to close that gap in our governance if we want data to be the new oil in our business models. I am uh, leaving you with just a few steps here that I've already talked, on, talked about, the, the, uh, the data checks, uh, the AI algorithm audit models, uh, the societal impact tests. Um, you know, if you want any of these slides later, please do contact me. On LinkedIn, please do tell me then uh, where you met me so that I can, uh, I, you know, I know that we have uh, had contact before. And of course, the governance and oversight models, okay? Lots and lots of very hands-on ideas here uh, that I can give you in classes as we design our new data business models. Uh, again, there is a tremendous frontier out there, a uh, two to three trillion dollar uh, market uh, we're estimating. Um, and, uh, you know, these are the top 50 global data and digital giants that are enabling all of this. So there is tremendous potential here uh, for us to take all of these companies to that next frontier, to create new startups in that next frontier uh, as, we, uh, as we proceed with the digital economy. Uh, and lots and lots of partners here, some of which are already very eager uh, to help you uh, do that, okay? So what we're giving you in these courses that I and others teach is a very hands-on tool and framework for how to do that, hopefully making you more valuable for these digital and non-digital employers, okay? With that said, I wanna thank you. Um, this is my contact information. 
uh, follow me. Uh, if you ping me on LinkedIn, please do say where you met me so I can readily accept. Uh, okay, and, uh, and I'm open for questions if we have time. Uh, sure, um, I can see questions in our Q&A box. So if you have any questions right now, uh, please type it in there. Um, but I would say, uh, let's, let's start off with that. So uh, we have one question, um, Olaf. Um, when we will converge into the technology itself, um, uh, rooting back to the beginning of your presentation? Well, you know, uh, uh, Baz, if I, if I pronounce that uh, correctly, um, uh, apologies if I'm not. Um, you know, the, there are, of course, people like uh, Mr. Kurzweil, right, who have promulgated the term uh, singularity, which means different things. It means the, when, you know, the base definition is uh, when the human brain and the computer brain become equally capable and powerful. And some people like Elon Musk are saying that, you know, the computer brain, the AI will at some point become a super intelligence. But then there's also the notion of us becoming one with machines physically. Uh, so basically the cyborg uh, scenario, um, you know, certainly that's a trajectory we're, we're on. But, uh, but frankly, uh, all the scientists I talk to uh, will tell you that's, you know, a number of decades out if it ever happens because the current technologies don't allow us to exponentially uh, proceed on this path. And so we're looking at probably 50 to 70 years before that happens. Um, but, you know, we, I will admit to you that we are sort of on a path where we're already augmenting ourselves. Uh, you saw me talk about uh, Elon Musk's uh, Neuralink venture, uh, augmenting our brains, augmenting our eyesight with smart retinas uh, and smart contact lenses. You could argue that even wearing glasses or having a pacemaker uh, or having an artificial limb or uh, a joint um, that is increasingly uh, smarter, right? Uh, that we are already on this path of cyborg. Um, but of course, uh, a lot of water will go under the bridge uh, before that ever happens at scale. And what I feel here, Bass, is that we, um, that we must uh, shape that path, that we shouldn't just roll over and accept it, but that we have the responsibility to make that palatable, to make that ethical, uh, to make that respectful and dignified. And while we're doing that, we can still make money at it, right? So, but, but clearly the respect needs to be at the forefront. Okay. Uh, and then, yeah, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I see here, Emiliano, uh, how do I get mm -hmm. into data science as a finance student? What skills should I learn? Emiliano, I got to tell you, as a finance person, you are already uh, fairly well uh, uh, positioned. Uh, one of the people I work with in my, my little company, uh, you can look me up on the web, uh, you know, Manu Kalia is my head of data science. He's a former uh, CFO uh, finance person. Before that, he was an engineer. Uh, I will not lie to you. This is, of course, uh, gives you a, a leg up on others that are less quantitative. Uh, and at Hult, you will uh, find that we give you data science courses. You can do the dual degree in business analytics. Uh, and... Um, uh, you know, even in the Master of Disruptive Innovation, we now have data strategy. Uh, and then, of course, you got people like me who are sort of in the uh, uh, data AI space as well. So, uh, so from my point of view, thumbs up, lots of ways uh, to get into that. Uh, Sarab, uh, in your opinion, what trait ensured that Microsoft as a company remained relevant in its position migrating from oil eco to data eco? Well, look, um, uh, uh, Sarab, uh, Microsoft under Bill Gates uh, obtained tremendous uh, market concentration power, okay, in that uh, it held a, a dominant position in operating systems and in some of the productivity software of the day. And it was able, just in time, there was, there were a couple of years of crisis where it was stagnating. But, you know, there was a, um, there was sort of a, uh, an effect, a longevity effect, uh, as they were uh, becoming less successful that carried them over into uh, this new paradigm of being very cloud and data uh, driven. Uh, and they have a, a tremendous, obviously deep, very deep pockets and tremendous portfolio of talent. Uh, I mean, when you talk to people who work at Microsoft, they'll tell you that, that these are some of the smartest people they've ever worked with. Um, and uh, they're all now, I think, with the right leadership, renewing that company uh, uh, for, for this new data era. So, uh, so from my point of view, thumbs up. Um, I will tell you, I have collaborated with their chief economist. Uh, I have, uh, uh, many ongoing dialogues 
with Jared Lanier, who is uh, uh, at the, the, the CTO's office there, Glenn Weil uh, and others, uh, and uh, some of their ventures groups as well. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited about Microsoft's potential going forward. Um, let's see, Katarina, uh, what do you think uh, is the future of humans in a world of doctors? Uh, if there are more IP addresses than neurons and technology keeps improving, what is the value, uh, uh, what is the value of humans? Um, Katarina, I'm going to try and answer the question. When you say in a world of doctors, uh, I, I'm not sure if you're saying that you are a doctor and from a doctor's perspective, what is the value of humans? But um, I will just answer the question broadly and hopefully answer your question specifically. Um, look, humans have an um, innate capability uh, to empathize uh, with other people. Even when you don't like each other, you're still very similar, right? You know what it feels like to have success on the job or to have heartbreak or to mourn somebody passing away, okay? Um, or to be in love, okay? Uh, or the joy of holding a child, right? All of those things are very much common to us as humans and that's the glue between us, okay? And that ability to feel empathy and act out empathy uh, is, uh, is one very much at the foundation of coaching, of mentoring, of counseling, uh, and, uh, and so those are all things that humans are much better able to do than machines and will be for quite some time to come, um, including things like making strategy, making new theory, right? Machines don't do that. Humans do. That's what a chess player does when he or she engages another chess player, right, is to devise a strategy on how to go from image A on the chessboard to image B, okay? Um, uh, transposing knowledge from one domain to another, very hard for machines to do, okay? Uh, instilling vision in other people, inspiration, ideation, all of those things are innately human and will remain human for a while to come. But we need to bring those into a symbiotic relationship with the more uh, structured and quantitative side of data science and artificial intelligence. We need to understand that better and also emphasize our innately human skills and traits, bringing both together, right? That's really what we're trying to do at Holt as well. Uh, as a computing student, um, let's see, would there be a possibility to join your team as an intern? Uh, uh, Maria, thank you. Uh, I, I will tell you, uh, we have repeatedly, really continuously hired interns from Holt. I, I put my money where my mouth is. Uh, I hire Holt uh, students. We are, um, uh, we have two of them working with us right now. My right-hand man, Tobias, uh, is a, an executive MBA from, uh, from, from Holt. Uh, and with every one of our books, and we're writing the second book now, uh, we are uh, leveraging the global uh, insights and knowledge and networks of Holt students. So the answer is definitely thumbs up. And if you're interested in that, uh, please do ping me on LinkedIn or when you come to Holt uh, by email as well. Uh, Let's see, um, what are your thoughts on healthcare data ownership, uh, hospitals versus patients? Patients, very clearly. Uh, patients need to own their data. Uh, however, uh, we as patients have a very clear responsibility to make our data avail available in an anonymized fashion, okay? If that is guaranteed, we have a responsibility to our society to give hospitals our data for research purposes, for security and safety purposes, better treatment options, okay? That is a responsibility we have. So I believe that it's a two-way street. Um, Ravi Ram, uh, in the world where we have many numbers of uh, open software when we are building the uh, makes uh, more vulnerable to data breach. You know, uh, Ravi Ram, um, you, you may be a, a coding expert and I, I'd love to hear about your experience when we meet at Health, but the, the fact of the matter is that open source is not necessarily uh, worse code than proprietary code. Uh, I think we sort of gotten beyond that. Uh, but of course, you're raising a more general point, which is that if everybody can start coding uh, AI models uh, and, and getting data, uh, then um, you know how do we assure security, right? Um, be, be just organizationally, how do we make sure that you're uh, you're a very democratized entrepreneur somewhere in a garage in Ohio or Shenzhen or wherever um, uh, has a top-notch cybersecurity to keep your data safe. Big issue, okay, big issue. So I agree with you on that. 
Will I Teach in London? Frederick, thank you. Uh, you are breaking my heart <laughs> because I love teaching in London and was scheduled to teach in London this year and couldn't go because of the virus. Uh, I will tell you, it's a fantastic campus. Uh, love the team there. Uh, it was actually, uh, my first course was taught there, Disruption Futures, which I'm teaching uh, uh, all over the world. Uh, so yes, I hope to get back to London uh, very soon, okay? Uh, let's see, uh, don't know how many positions Olaf may have, but if there is other people looking for computer internships, ping me, very good, thank you, Baz. Uh, what is your opinion uh, on the US TikTok banning? Very political, uh, and Katarina, and um, uh, I, I also uh, am somebody who, who says that we need to critically engage with China, uh, and we always need to make sure that our data is safe. Now, that just doesn't just go for China, that goes for uh, US uh, companies, that goes for European companies, African companies, any company. Um, but uh, we, we must not be misled by convenience only. So I do believe that we all have to be very vigilant uh, about network security and about data security. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. But of course, yes, uh, politically motivated. You also saw that Great Britain has banned Huawei from its networks. US and Great Britain are obviously in lockstep on this thing. Uh, so watch this space.